to new people and to all day. <laughs> Number one, please put your phones on silent. If you don't mind. Okay. And welcome to our talk titled Economics of Stuff by Alan Swat. I'm going to give you a few lines in the bio. Okay. Owen Blackbeard Swart is a senior member of Starfleet, the International Star Trek Fan Association Incorporated. Holding the rank of Rear Admiral and the big chair in the local chapter, the USS Dauntless. Owen has actively and enthusiastically served the cause of Star Trek fan fandom for almost two decades. If you need to know how transport works, which correct Starfleet uniform to wear, or the blight way to be the cleaner. Owen is the guy you should ask. Okay. As he was out of the third Thank you, Owen. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, then uh, I'm not going to bother reading all of that because you've heard it all. So, uh, <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, I titled this Let Me Help. Now, what, what does that mean? Where does Let Me Help come into economics? Well, it comes from this. Uh, scene, which is in an episode of the original series called Sitting on the Edge of Forever, where Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are accidentally thrust back in time to the 1930s uh, during World War II, and they encounter this woman, Edith Keeler, who uh, Kirk and uh, Spock remark reminds them of the kind of people that they encounter in their time, in the 23rd century, because she has a what they perceive as a, uh, a unique, or at least a rare, um, uh, uh, insistence on altruism. On, on working tirelessly and, um, and uh, well, working tirelessly for the betterment of mankind and even at her own tremendous expense. And uh, in a conversation with, with Edith, uh, Kirk says this, let me help. A hundred years or so from now, a famous novelist will write a classic using that theme. He'll recommend these three words even over I love you. So this sparked um, a, uh, a series of of philosophical ideas that were explored and expanded on greatly in Star Trek over the coming decades, um, specifically around the cultural and economic uh, circumstances in which these people from the future find themselves. They think of themselves as, uh, as having transcended personal interest into a, a, a milieu of, of uh, altruism and the service of mankind, of humankind, of humanoid kind later on. <laughs> All right, so, when I'm doing this kind of analysis of Star Trek, it's important to, to declare upfront what my constraints are. So I like to practice a thing called uh, Star Trek apologetics. So what, is, what does apologetics mean? Well, it means uh, uh, never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> okay, well, literally what it means is uh, reason, arguments, or writings and justification of something, typically a theory or religious doctrine. So you'll typically come across the word apologetics um, in, in fields like theology and biblical scholarship. And, and typically it takes the form of trying to reconcile apparent contradictions within a sacred text or contradictions between a sacred text and reality. Um, and and it's, a, it's a thrilling intellectual pursuit trying to come up with justifications and rationalizations to marry these apparent contradictions. And I like to do that in Star Trek just for the fun of it. So we have several assumptions that we have to, uh, that we have to start with. This is our, our springboard from which we uh, undertake this endeavor. Uh, firstly, is that Star Trek is inerrant. <coughs> so much like when you're, when you're performing uh, uh, theology, you have to assume that the sacred text that you're reading is true and uh, is inspired by the, whatever deity you happen to subscribe to. Uh, so we, we make that same assumption here, that Star Trek is true, everything we see on screen is 100% accurate, and that any, uh, any mistakes that we might see, whether they're either internal or external, are just are either misinterpretations on our part, or uh, that there's some logical explanation to explain the, the apparent contradiction. Contradictions cannot exist because it's real. So therefore we have to make a, a conceit, which most theologians won't allow, but we will. We obviously know that Star Trek is fiction, but for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to assume that Star Trek is historical, and that it's somehow been uh, granted to us from the future as actual historical visual records of things that have yet to happen in our real future. Historical documents. Exactly, historical <laughs> documents. So it's a, um, uh, we just suspend disbelief and we pretend that it's real for the purposes of, of performing this exercise. Um, right, so we need to define what our canon is. So in biblical scholarship, you, you're dealing with the Bible, right? Except that it's not that clear. Lots of different of factions of the Christian faith have different versions of the Bible. They have different books and different texts that they include or exclude. 
So we need to first decide what is our canon and what isn't our canon. Now, in a room of 10 Star Trek fans, you'll come up with 12 different definitions of what a canon is. But there is kind of a, a generically understood um, an accepted version of what constitutes canon, and, and that's what I'm going to go with. Even though I don't like it, it's not my personal choice, that's the one we're going to use. And that, and that looks like this. So we've got the TV series, which includes the original Star Trek from 1966, uh, Star Trek Next Generation, the sequel, the first spin-off, Deep Space Nine, the second spin-off, Voyager, uh, the prequel series, Star Trek Enterprise, and of course the new series, Star Trek Discovery. Now I know we're only four episodes into Discovery, uh, and we haven't really fleshed out that version of the Star Trek universe yet, so I'm going to try and avoid any spoilers. <coughs> try, no promises, uh, but I'll, I'll make every effort not to, not to ruin that for you guys. We also have the 13 feature films, uh, the motion picture from 1978, the uh, trilogy that was its sequel, um, Star Trek V, which is the one I would rather cut out if, if we possibly could, because it just creates too many problems, but we have to include it, we don't get to choose. Um, Star Trek VI, which is the final original series movie, the next generation movies, Generations, First Contact, uh, Insurrection, and Nemesis, and then also, controversially, but we don't get to choose the most uh, recent three films, Star Trek, which was what was the full title of the 2009 movie, uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. Right, so this is canon. Everything that we've seen on screen in any of those. Sorry to interrupt. The animated series is that taken? We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, <laughs> everything that we've seen on screen in any of these things is taken as historical fact. These are the historical documents. Now, on the other side of the coin, we've got stuff that we can just safely ignore. So that includes uh, Star Trek novels, of which there are many. Now, that's not to say that there's nothing of value in Star Trek novels. O often what happens is a, a, an author will come up with an interesting idea, an interesting explanation, in, uh, in the narrative of their novel, which then later on gets incorporated into the Star Trek canon, but until it's actually on screen, it doesn't count. Uh, a good example of this would be the, the Remans being a separate offshoot of the, of the Romulan and Vulcan race that look different, they have undergone some kind of genetic transformation. This was a fairly common theme in novels, but we didn't see that on screen until Star Trek Nemesis. So that idea is now canon, but it wasn't until I think, the 2002 when the, when the movie came out. Um, for the same reason, we can also safely disregard the comics. Uh, it's, <coughs> it's interesting ideas and a cool exploration of the universe, but it's not canon, it wasn't on screen. Uh, games, much to my disdain, we can't include that. I mean, there's some fascinating ideas in games. Star Trek Le Legacy had an excellent idea about where the war came from. Uh, the ongoing Star Trek Online massively multiplayer online role playing game does a fantastic job of, of tying together apparently completely separate story arcs into one big glorious narrative and allows you to explore it in real time. It's beautiful, but we, we just, we can't achieve it. But then, uh, oh, of course, fan fiction. Of, uh, it should go without saying, but there is some really, really good stuff out there. There's a lot of crap. <laughs> uh, but if you do a, a YouTube search for fan film productions, some of them are fantastic. Superlative production quality. Really, really interesting writing and acting and special effects, but because it's not licensed material, it doesn't count, unfortunately. Um, but between canon and, and non-canon, there's this kind of gray area in the middle called the Apocrypha. <laughs> <laughs> so this is stuff that, um, under certain, certain circumstances, can be treated sort of as canon, unless it's directly contradicted by something in proper canon. And that includes the Star Trek The Animated Adventures. Uh, now, the reason it's here and not in canon is because Gene Roddenberry himself, um, due to political issues in the production schedule, I won't go into too much detail, but he specifically declared that the animated series was not canon. But in the years since his death, Paramount and uh, more recently CBS, who are the license holders for Star Trek, have been treating the animated series as kind of sort of canon. Uh, it creates a lot of, of contradictory <laughs> problems, things like it pushes the launch date of the Enterprise way back, like three decades earlier than it should have been. It gives us holodeck technology far too early and that kind of thing. Um, but there are other technological and narrative elements that have been picked up in other uh, material later on. So we can, the way I see it is this. This is, it's a dramatization of history as opposed to actual historical documents. So we can look at it for the broad narrative themes, but we can't uh, rely, on, rely on it for any details, especially when it's contradicted by actual canon. We also have technical manuals. So these are uh, documents that are created by uh, the creators of the show. Gene Roddenberry wrote several of them himself as a bible for the writers of the series, uh, as a reference work where they can uh, draw facts about this 
frictional universe in order to construct a cohesive narrative that works together and without internal in inconsistencies. A lot of the material in the technical manuals never actually made it on screen, and some of that stuff has been contradicted in, in, in subsequent years, so that any, any apparent contradictions, obviously we have to side with canon over the technical manuals, but for those gaps, we can probably rely on technical manuals as being fairly good sources of, of information. We also have licensed non-fiction material. So this is uh, uh, books and other pu uh, publications put out by CBS and Paramount um, about Star Trek, but not set in universe. So that's things like the Star Trek Encyclopedia, the Star Trek Fact Files, um, the Star Trek Star Charts. There's a plethora of these books that are written about Star Trek based on uh, partly on canon and partly on the technical manuals in order to try and act as a reference work for these things. Uh, there are problems there as well, where there are uh, things that were, uh, were released in early versions of these things were later contradicted in canon, so obviously we have to accede to canon when that happens, but generally speaking it's an acceptable reference. Um, and then there's backstage information, which happens increasingly nowadays, now that we have things like YouTube and Twitter, where the, the people who work on the show will let bits and pieces of information go uh, about their intentions behind a particular prop or piece of technology or a storyline or a character trait. Um, and that we can generally regard as being relatively canon, although obviously we have to, uh, we have to uh, maintain the, the canon first rule. All right, so we can't talk about the economics of Star Trek without coming across the word utopia. Uh, Star Trek is this utopian future society. So what is, what is a utopia? So uh, the definition is, it's an imagined place or state of things in which everything is perfect. And it coined this term, I said, the term was coined by Thomas More in his novel in the Renaissance. Um, his novel, Utopia, was a reimagining of Plato's, I think it was the Republic, where he described um, Atlantis as being this perfect society. Now, Thomas More took that idea and turned it into a narrative, into a novel, but it's the same basic idea. He also derived the word from Greek, uh, it basically means no place. It's not a real place. Almost by definition, a utopia can't exist. Um, so is the United Federation of Planets, a uh, utopia. Well, these are the things that we see characters on screen trotting out. Poverty, disease, violence, crime, they've all been eliminated. But just because they say it doesn't mean it's true. Now, this is, this is one of the cool things about Star Trek apologetics. Not everything that every character says is necessarily accurate. Sometimes they get it wrong, sometimes they have fallible perceptions, sometimes they're subject to propaganda. And I'm, I suspect that this might be a little bit of propaganda. So there should also be liars. <laughs> right, so so let, let's see if we can find uh, uh, examples of these things that are, are available in the Star Trek universe for us to see. So what about poverty? Well, here we have a picture of Turkana 4, which is the, the birthplace of Lieutenant Tashi Yar. It's a failed federation colony that when its economy collapsed, its government collapsed, and then it turned into this, this hellish ghetto run by gangsters that just went on and on for decades. Um, now, the reason its government collapsed is because its economy collapsed. How can an economy collapse if there's no poverty? Well, because the Federation kicked them out as soon as they got poor, and then they no longer had that Federation <laughs> support. <laughs> so it's not that poverty isn't possible in the Federation, it's that poverty isn't allowed. <laughs> um, we also think of, of Deep Space Nine and the Bajoran application to join the Federation. Um, it was suspended, put on hold for years and years, not because the Bajorans were bad people or anything like that, but because their economy was in tatters after the Cardassian occupation. They hadn't yet gotten themselves to a point where they could stand on their own feet and then not be a drain on the resources of the Federation. So they were given an opportunity to, uh, to have provisional membership status, they were protected by the Federation while they got their crap together, and then eventually they were going to be allowed in. What about disease? Well, we see they have magical uh, medical technology that can cure just about everything. Except that every third episode, somebody's sick and dying. <laughs> right? So um, here we have David McCoy, ironically the father of uh, Leonard H. McCoy, and, and he's dying of some disease. I don't think they actually mentioned the name of the disease. We hear in the dialogue that they found a cure for the disease not long after he died. Um, there's that magical medical technology again. But that doesn't mean that disease doesn't happen. It happens all the time. Perhaps it doesn't happen to your average Federation citizen. Perhaps your, your, your resident of a suburb in Paris never gets sick. But some people do. Um, disease does exist in the Federation. What about violence? Well, we don't see people writing on the streets of, of San Francisco, but uh, there's always this guy, Lon Sudo, who was a, a Betazoid who had a birth defect. He was born without the empathic uh, abilities that most Betazoids have. And this seems to have resulted in him developing something that we would call uh, psychopathy. 
he becomes a serial killer and murders people on violently uh, aboard the Voyager before Tuvok, Tuvok already uh, eventually apprehends and tries to rehabilitate him. Now, this is a, a two for one. Not only is he an extremely violent person, but he's also sick. He has a disease of the mind, which is apparently incurable in the 24th century, which is what led to him in this situation in the first place. <coughs> what about crime? How can crime exist in a, in a spoiler in a world where, where currency doesn't exist? Well, ask Tom Paris, seen here in prison. <laughs> Obviously, he's, he's committed some kind of a crime. It might, he didn't rob a bank. He didn't steal a loaf of bread to survive. Uh, he... He had made some mistakes in the academy, landed in the, in the, the company of, of, uh, of sketchy people, and ended up committing treason. Treason, still a crime. It might not be the kind of crime that we, we see all the time today, but it is still a crime, and he did still have to go to prison for it. Of course, Federation prisons in the 24th century are basically either hospitals or rehabilitation colonies, and he ends up being uh, rehabilitated as a, as a successful staffing officer. But uh, it is still a prison jumpsuit he's wearing, and, uh, and that's the thing that happens. Or what about suffering? Uh, has suffering been eliminated? Well, we ask the Maquis. So this is a group of people, in case you're not familiar or linked with your Star Trek history, after a sustained conflict between the Federation and the Cardassians, there was a treaty signed which demarcated a region of space called the Demilitarized Zone. It basically redrew the borders between Cardassian and Federation space. And that redrawing of the borders meant that some Federation planets, territories, colonies, ended up on the Cardassian side of the border, and vice versa. Now, Starfleet did their best to evacuate those Federation colonists who were going to end up on the Cardassian side of the new border, but not all of them wanted to leave. They had lived there their whole lives, they had set up these colonies, these, their, their homes, they didn't want to abandon them. And they were prepared to take their chances under Cardassian rule. Uh, it turns out the Cardassians, uh, that, you know, it didn't really work out for them. Um, so they, it, they uh, got pretty upset about it and they formed a, a resistance movement which eventually got named the Maquis consisting partly of those disaffected colonists and then other sort of sketchy types from the area like Bajoran militia and, uh, and Tom Paris. Uh, those sorts of people that even under Federation governments, uh, even as a Federation citizen, suffer, you're not immune to suffering, it's still a thing that happens. So let's ask the question again, is the Federation a utopia? Well, for your average person on the street, it probably is pretty cool, but it's not really a utopia. There is still all these bad things that do still happen, but the Federation is a pretty nice place. <coughs> right. So how do we get there? How does that happen? Don't tell me. You don't use money in the 23rd century. Well, we don't. So this was a line that was in uh, Star Trek for the Voyage Home. We'll be watching that a little later. And this was another pivotal moment in Star Trek apologetics because it introduced us to this notion of a, of a future world without currency. And how does that work? And we've been trying to figure that out for decades, since 1984. So let's, let's look at, at what money is. What does money do? So money is all about scarcity. It's, but let's come up with a, a, define, a definition of money. What's it for? So money is it's a universal medium of exchange whereby incomparable materials and objects can be assigned relative value so as, so as to facilitate and expedite trade. Right? Cool, move on. Okay, let's explore that. Um, right, so let's say you have two uh, commodities that are very, very different far more different than apples and oranges. On the left there we've got self-sealing stem bolts. As you can see we've got a lot of them. On the right hand side we've got the Vase and wormhole. Now we know that the Vase and wormhole turned out to be worthless, but let's pretend for the moment that it was legitimate. It's this stable wormhole inside Vase and space that takes you to the gamma quadrant across the galaxy and facilitates a, a, an easy and quick trade route. Now let's say I want to go through the Vase and wormhole, but all I have is self-sealing stem bolts. These two things are not comparable. How can I devise a price in self sealing stem bolts for a passage through the wormhole? It doesn't really work. But if we can come up with some kind of system that allows us to assign a numerical value to each of these things, let's say five credits for a self sealing stem bolt and 50,000 credits through, for a trip through the wormhole, <coughs> suddenly we're speaking the same language. These two vastly different commodities are now comparable. So it now, it'll cost me 10,000 self sealing stem bolts to get through the wormhole. Or, if the guy who's running the toll booth at the wormhole doesn't want self sealing stem bolts, I can find a buyer for those bolts, get the credits, and then give that to the toll booth operator. And then I can buy my, my passage to the, uh, to the wormhole. So what we're looking at is, it's a, uh, money is a tool for managing scarcity of resources. Now, these two things are vastly different. Let's compare two, two objects that are a bit more similar. So we've got self sealing stem bolts again on the left-hand side, and now we have this 
which is a 19 something something, I forget the days, Roger Maris baseball card. Uh, the last one known to exist as it, as it appears there in uh, Kiva Spajo's collection in the episode uh, The Most Toys from the Next Generation. Now these two objects are relatively similar, they're about the same size, they're manufactured objects, um, but one important difference between the two is that there are a lot of self-seeding stem bolts and there's one Roger Maris baseball card. So we can assign a value based on their scarcity. So if I want to buy uh, a Roger Maris baseball card, it will cost me a million self-seeding stem bolts because there are just a lot of self-seeding stem bolts. So this brings us to the supply versus demand question, which is an important law when it comes to, uh, to economics. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes they're inversely proportional, and this happens when something is scarce becomes is extremely valuable. So when, when the demand is high and the supply is low, then that creates value. If supply, if, uh, supply is high and the demand is high, then that's fine. But, but when supply is low and demand is high, that creates a, a value. And that's why the, the Roger Maris baseball card costs five billion instead of five. But then that's, that scale can, can tip. So when something is abundant, it's cheap. When you have lots of self-seeding stem bolts, they're only five credits a piece because they're easy to combine. Although a lot of people need self-seeding stem bolts, probably, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, but they're easy to combine, they're ubiquitous. At least that one guy had a whole bunch of them. Uh, but taken to the logical extreme, when you have an infinite supply of something, it becomes free. There's no longer any point charging any money for something that is infinite and freely available to everyone. So this is what we call an abundance-based economy, which consists of common goods. So this is what economists call it. Uh, whenever something is free, uh, or freely abundantly available to everyone, it becomes a common good. The easiest example for that is air. Air is abundant. Granted, we know that there isn't an in actual infinite supply of air, but as far as anybody is concerned, we have access to all the air we could possibly want. It may as well be infinite. A slightly more complicated example is space. There is infinite supply of space. Using it is tricky, because you have to build a rocket, and an interstellar, interstellar space drive and that kind of thing to get out there. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk is working on it, but we're still a ways away. Um, space might be infinitely, might be infinite and freely available to all, but there's a barrier to entry to actually gaining access to it. It's still a common good, though. We still have access to it. It's just hard. Another more complicated example is water. Seventy percent of the Earth's surface is covered by water. It is freely available to all. We have all the water we could possibly want. So why do we pay a bolt to drug of water at the end of the month? Why do we pay for bottles of, of, uh, of Valpre at the, at the garage shop? Well, because when we buy that water, we're not buying the water. When you're paying your bolt to, to drug of water, you're paying for the infrastructure that brings that water, cleans it, and pipes it directly into your bathroom. There's no, nothing that anybody can do to stop you from walking down to the nearest river with a bucket and helping yourself to as much water as you want. Um, but that's not inconvenient. Uh, Jobo water provides a service, and it's the service that you're paying for. The same goes for bottled mineral water. You're paying for the processing that's gone into that thing, you're paying for the convenient, uh, convenient packaging, and you're paying for the brand. That's why you pay 15 bucks for a bottle of Valpre and 8 bucks for a bottle of Aquilay. Um, so water is a common good. It's freely available in infinite quantities for everyone. Water is free, but you can pay a little bit extra for it if you want that extra Catanians wouldn't agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, if they look out their window, there's an abundance of water. They can just go down to the beach or the bucket, but they, they want fresh water, and now they're just getting picky. <laughs> radio spectrum is another uh, complicated one. Radio spectrum is freely available to everyone. There's nothing that anybody can do to stop you from building yourself a little radio set, set to any frequency, and start broadcasting. A cussle will be very cross with you if you do that. But because they don't own the radio spectrum, the radio spectrum is a property of the universe. The Icasa have just been empowered by government laws to police the radio spectrum. Because it kind of makes sense that everybody gets allocated a specific part of the spectrum for their use, so that everybody gets to use it freely. It's a bit like traffic on the roads. Um, land is an infinite resource, but if we police the traffic, then everybody can get along just fine. The same goes for the radio spectrum. It's yours for free, you can have it, but Icasa will uh, or get cross with you if you try to use it inappropriately, if you use a part of the spectrum that hasn't been allocated uh, to you. And you can also pay your cost of billions of brands if you want access to a, a particular part of the spectrum and what, if you want uh, them to keep other people off your grass. Um, a new one is the internet. So this isn't a naturally occurring concept. It's something that people ourselves have built over the last few decades. Now, any given part of the internet internet, uh, your, uh, your ISP, the, the, the ADSL line that comes into your home, that's not a common good, that's not free, you have to pay to use that. 
a specific website like google.com belongs to Google. That's not free, that's not available to everyone, or I suppose it is in their case, but it belongs to them. They can take it back. But neither of those things, neither the ADSL line nor google.com has any value whatsoever unless it's plugged into the network, into the internet that connects all of those computer systems together. Mm -hmm. And it's that network, that infrastructure, that is free and open to everyone. So while you're paying a fee to gain access to it, because you're paying for the wires or the, the radio transmitters or whatever you're uh, using to gain access to it, the thing that you're gaining access to is free and available to everyone indefinitely. And in fact, that particular one, the internet, has opened doors and allows us uh, to expand the frontier of common goods to other more interesting areas, such as uh, small objects. So if you go to a website called thingiverse.com, you can download a, uh, a 3D model pattern, which you can then feed into your 3D, pr 3D printer at home, or if you don't have one, take it to your brain. Everybody, mm -hmm. I think, on this room knows somebody. If you don't already have a 3D printer yourself, you know someone who's got one, or there are commercial services that'll print these things for you. Um, give them the pattern, and they'll give it to you. That, that Although you've paid for the plastic that's gone into the thing, you've paid for the printer, you've paid for the service, the object itself was effectively uh, free. That's how I got this, which is my official Starfleet sidearm. It's a, Ceremonial replica of a Type 1 phaser. I downloaded this from the internet, I sent it off to a member of our crew who has a printer, and he created this for me. <laughs> so small objects are now common goods, uh, which follows on from open source software. So open source software is any uh, application that's been written, published for free on the internet, and made available under an open source license. The idea being that anybody who can then access that uh, piece of software on the internet can download it and use it, or they can change it and upload their own version and make that available to other people. Open source software has been created by software developers specifically to be a, a, a common good. It's available to everyone. Now, there, there might be custom specific versions of open source software, like, the, like Google's Chrome browser is a specific um, proprietary version of the Chromium open source browser, but it's still free and available to everyone. You can still go and access and release your own version of Chromium if you choose to. Um, Royalty-free music is an interesting one too. This is something that's, that's only arisen in the last few years. Uh, again, content creators can create their music and then upload them to these royalty-free music services and have them available for free to anyone who wants them. Zoe Keating has made a, quite a name for herself by uh, originally publishing a lot of her work on a royalty-free music service. Um, and she now gets a lot of work in Hollywood doing uh, theme songs for various uh, TV shows and movies. Uh, she understood that making stuff available under a, a common good um, allows her to leverage that into, instead of currency, as instead of money, it becomes reputation, and that reputation can then be turned into other things down the line. Um, literature is also becoming a common good, and I'm not just talking about stuff that's in the public domain, things that are older than Mickey Mouse, because of course you know how that whole thing works. Disney owns copyright. Anything older than Mickey Mouse is in the public domain, anything newer than Mickey Mouse is, uh, you know, the, the, the time limits on those get extended every few years. Um, but any, anything that's in the public domain is available for free to anyone. All you need to do is pay for the paper and ink involved in producing a copy of it. But there are also online services, Google is one of them, um, uh, archive.org is another, who see it as their mission to not only make all, all of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the public license, public domain literature available to everybody for free on the internet, but they're also working on other, other material that is newer material. They scan all the books and they make it available online so that you can go onto their website and if not browse through the book itself, you can at least uh, look, up, uh, look up a specific reference, cite a, a chapter and verse or whatever you need in, your, in your, uh, your transformative work that you're creating out of that. You can, uh, and you can do that all for free because literature is now, they see anyway, as a common good. Now, of course, there are legal issues around that. Both archive.org and Google have been sued by various different copyright holders. So it's not exactly a settled issue, but at least there's a, a concerted multi-billion dollar effort underway to transform all of literature into a common good. Um, but now this looks like it's becoming a trend. And what, what common goods are coming in the near future? I predict we're looking at everyday household objects. So instead of just little plastic toys and that kind of thing, what if everything could be 3D printed for free using a, a model that you downloaded off your internet? So knives, uh, knives, cups, spoons, uh, blankets, clothing, any object that you need in your house that you would buy from a, a, from a, a supermarket or something like that can just be generated ex nihilo practically in your own home. 
we, we see a day when that's coming because 3D printers are becoming more and more sophisticated. Not only are they able to produce things from plastic, but the more advanced models that most of us can't afford can now use other materials like metal, ceramics, and that kind of thing. And not only that, but they are even able to, to produce organic matter, some of the more really expensive ones. So we're looking at food that's generated effectively ex nihilo. You go and buy a bag of synthetic protein, and then it gets turned into a tofu burger or something that tastes like a tofu burger, something that looks like a bun, something that vaguely resembles a cabbage. Um, but it's just a matter of time before we're able to synthesize a, a, a convincing replica of real food uh, that's out of a box in your kitchen. Um, entertainment, we're already kind of there in a lot of respects. Um, if you use a service like Google Play or iTunes or Netflix, you're paying a monthly fee to use a service, and then you have unlimited access to all of the content that they have in their library. So again, you're, you're, you're paying them because they're providing you the service, you're paying for use of their server, but all of that content you're not paying for, you're effectively getting that for free. And we're just gonna see that grow. We're gonna see games and all kinds of other uh, forms of entertainment being included in that model. Soon you'll be paying one monthly fee and you'll get all the entertainment you could possibly want. Public transport, well this is a, uh, it's a project that's been ongoing since public transport has become a thing. The idea is to make it a common good available to all. Um, in some places in the world that's already happened. Here it's not quite there yet, but we're seeing more ubiquitous uh, public transport systems becoming available as things like the car train bus system is being expanded in Kaya. All it means is that it needs to get the, uh, common enough, maintenance, uh, the maintenance costs on those services need to come down so that it's effectively affordable, so that the, the amount of money that you're paying to use public transport is uh, either zero or very, very little, effectively zero. And of course, with self-driving cars, we're looking at private transport, where it no longer makes sense for you to own your own car. If your car can drive itself, why have it sitting in a parking lot waiting for you all day when it could be driving other people around? Um, and if you have enough people using a system like that, you have the same sort of subscription model, where you pay one monthly fee, and then you can use infinite cars as much as you like. And all of this stuff can be bundled together if you look at something like universal basic income, when everybody gets paid a certain amount of money, let's call it a thousand grand a month from the government, and then it covers all of those fees. Effectively, all that stuff becomes free. Sure, it's being paid for out of taxes, but for the average user on the street, you effectively don't have to pay for any of it. So this is what we call the abundance economy, where we're, we're no longer using money to manage scarcity, we now just have all the resources we could possibly want for free or effectively free. Um, in the 24th century, they are, there's a confluence of technologies that allows this abundance economy to become fully realized instead of just in, in patchy bits and pieces as we have it today. First of those technologies is this, the matter-antimatter -matter annihilation reactor core. Uh, it's the most efficient form of energy production that we know of. If you take some antimatter and some matter, you smash it together and nothing but energy comes out. It's super, super efficient, far, far better than any fusion uh, reactor could possibly produce. We technically today do not have the technology to produce this except in laboratory settings, so we, we can't rely on it. But by the 23rd and 24th century, they have figured out how to make it uh, available to everyone. So there's all the energy anyone could possibly want. It's free and available to all. They also have super advanced computing technology, which kind of underpins most of what's, uh, what is uh, possible in the 24th century. Combine these two things, infinite energy and infinite computing power, and you have the replicator. It's the ultimate extension of 3D printing technology. But let's go into a bit more. Uh, detail about how that works. In the 24th century, because of that, that enabling technology, the replicator, uh, the list of common goods available to everyone has expanded to include pretty much everything. <laughs> Any material need you could want is available from a box in your kitchen. And because it's free to build, replicators can make other replicators, uh, and energy is available for free. There's an infinite supply of replicators available, and everybody can have one in their house, and their every need is seen to by the replicator. At least material needs. Um, so how do we get there? How do we get to a world where a replicator exists? Um, and and I've, I've mentioned the notion of 3D printing already, which was invented in the, in the 80s. It's, it's what we call additive manufacturing, which is the, the process of creating a thing by adding more material to it. So 3D printers, this is, you might have something similar to that at home or know somebody who has something similar to that. You can buy these at places like Macro and Game today. Perhaps not that specific model, that's quite a fancy one, but something like it. They're becoming affordable, within 10 to 15 years we'll all have one in our house. Um, it, they're relatively uh, simple these days, but they're getting better all the time, and uh, they have higher resolution, multiple uh, materials, all that kind of thing. By the 22nd century, that technology has evolved to a next 
and next step. Where it's able to synthesize organic edit, edible materials, and I said, we're all kind of, really kind of on the doorstep of that. But here, uh, Lieutenant Sato is standing in front of a uh, drink dispenser on the mess of the Enterprise NX01. That looks kind of like uh, um, uh, the kind of drink dispenser that you might find in a, a workplace kitchen today. It's got a, a list of buttons down the side where you can select the beverage you want. You put your, your mug in the slot, uh, press the, the button for the, the, the beverage that you choose, and it just pours out a little spout into the cup. That's a, a, a very familiar experience to those of us who have worked in a corporate workplace in the 21st century. What's different here is what's happening behind the, the, the silver wall. There isn't a little tank containing coffee, a little tank containing milk, a little tank containing water. All there is is a, one giant tank containing, frankly, it's sewage. Um, <laughs> which is then getting reorganized at the molecular level into the stuff that, that uh, Hoshi has ordered, whatever it is, let's assume it's coffee. So that sewage is being broken down into its component proteins and then rebuilt back up again into the proteins that resemble coffee and then poured into the mug. So it's, it's effectively 3D printing a liquid. By the 23rd century, it's gotten even more sophisticated. Now the, the device's name has changed again, it's now called a matter synthesizer. So here, in one little slot in the wall, um, what you do is you, you insert your little memory storage device into that little slot there, and then it produces the thing that you want. Here, there's some ice cream and some kind of soda float or something, whatever it is. But now this device has not only synthesized the food, it has not only reorganized those proteins into something edible, but it's also manufactured the bowl and the glass uh, on demand in seconds. It's a far more sophisticated version of this thing, but it's still the same basic idea. It's added to manufacturing. It's 3D printing, just using a more precise and a more, uh, more sophisticated method. By the 24th century, thanks to that uh, isolated computing technology, we now have the fully formed replicator, which can create just about anything out of sewage. Um, <clears throat> but it's using a, a, a way that does it at a, at a subatomic level, so that everything is broken down to its, co to its component elements and then rebuilt back up into whatever you need. And it's not just edible things, it's not just food and bowls and cups. You can order anything from a uniform to a phaser pistol to a trike order to medicine. Um, from one food station, you can do all of those things. Of course, there are different replicators that have different capabilities. The one in your quarters probably couldn't make you a phaser. Um, you might need to go to one in security for a specific uh, replicator that has the, the technical capabilities for doing that. Or you might have to go, go down to the shuttle bay to find one that is capable of replicating component parts to build your own shuttle from scratch but guaranteed that Galaxy Class Starship has those things on board. No material need goes unwanted. Um, so what we're looking at here is effectively what I call bottom-up communism. So communism in the 20th century hasn't worked because it comes from the top down. Um, some guys in charge, either following a, uh, uh, an election or, or some kind of uh, 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 tutorial uh, takeover, um, have decided, okay guys, from now on we're all going to be communists um, and you all have to do this and we're all going to do that. Um, so in other words, a communist system, at, at least so far, can't work without dictating to every member of that society what they may or may not do, what they may or may not say, and what is expected of them on a day-to-day -day basis. But bottom-up communism has some interesting ideas and let, let's follow this through to its, uh, to its conclusion. So the way you start with uh, bottom-up communism is you start with free market capitalism something like what we have today. Of course, we don't have a pure free market capitalist society today. There is a government that exists that puts some restraints on, on things to stop things from running away with uh, monopolies and that kind of thing. But it's kind of sort of generally a free market capitalist society. You then let it run for a long time, centuries, unrestrained with, with human creativity in the mix, allowing people to come up with new and interesting ways of, of, uh, of generating products, of creating new things, new, new things that can be made and more efficient way, ways of creating them, uh, and shifting around the means of production. Now, means of production, that's a Marxist term, and we'll come back to that. Um, if you give it enough time, and you give it enough uh, creativity, and you give it enough uh, iterations of, in, of improving efficiency of production, scarcity eventually disappears. Um, the things that we wanted are now freely available to everyone, everything is a common good, so the price of everything drops to zero. And once everything drops to zero, um, well, you kind of have communism, right? No? Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's take a, a different perspective. What does like, life look like if you live on 24th century Earth? Um, so prices are all zero because everything is abundant. 
Money's become redundant. What's the point of having money if you don't have to pay for anything ever? Um, no video in salaries, same reason. Uh, labor is no longer scarce because everybody has all the material needs that they need to survive. People are abundant, uh, means of, of production are super efficient, so you don't need a lot of people to build things. And in fact, replicators make uh, human labor virtually uh, redundant as well because anything you need can just be produced for free. So nobody has to earn a salary. You don't need to uh, work to live because all of your material needs are created for free by your free replicator. Um, and private ownership of property is still possible. So that's an interesting one. This is not something that is compatible with communism as we know it. But we do see it on screen in Star Trek. You see that uh, uh, um, uh, Jake Sis uh, ben Sisko's father owns his restaurant in New Orleans. We see that um, uh, Robert Picard owns his vineyard in Lyon, France. Um, private ownership of property somehow still works in the system. Well, how does it work? It's because the system that has generated this bottom-up communism is still founded on the principles of free market capitalism. Those rules, those laws that allow free market co capitalism to prosper still exist, and they still permit the private ownership of property. The property doesn't have any value anymore, so who cares if you own it or not? Because it's yours to do with as you please, and there's an infinite supply. Now that's uh, travel to space, remember that common good above our heads? Now that's possible too. If you want a, a huge amount of land, and there isn't enough land available on Earth, you just move somewhere else where it is available. Land is a common good too, it also has no value. Um, but what happens, and this is key, in this economy where money no longer has value, material goods no longer have value, what does have value? Personal reputation. Remember, I mentioned Zoe Keating, the example of the, the artist who created her royalty-free music, and then leveraged that into a reputation which has now allowed her to make a living out of being a composer. What we're looking at here is an entire economy of people who do exactly that. They work for the sake of building their own reputations and then leverage that reputation into more work, more important things, more interesting things. Um, but where are all the free riders? So now we have an economy where reputation is value, but you don't have to pay for anything. You don't have to work. What's the point? Why not, if you don't have to work, why not just sit at home playing Xbox all day? Why not sit in your, in your own little private hollow suite playing the 24th century version of World of Warcraft, which sounds amazing. <laughs> but why not do that? Why did we see people doing that on screen? What we see is these highly motivated, very talented people out in space, putting themselves in dangerous situations for nothing, for no commercial reason, for no, no value. They're not getting paid. Well, let's look at another image of, of this, the same time. Now, all of these people down here in the front, in the gray and red uniforms, they're all starfleet. They've all gotten off the couch and they're doing this for some reason, for reputation, sure, okay, fine. Now let's just ignore the cataclysm that's going on there. Um, but now, look over here. All of these high-rise buildings. What's going on in there? People live there. Those are residential complexes. That's where the free riders are. We don't see them on screen because they're boring. But they're there. They're sitting there. They're sitting playing Xbox. They're sitting playing 24th century World of Warcraft. And it's fine. Who cares? They're not a drain on the economy because everything is free. Every material need is catered for. It doesn't matter that they're free riding. It really doesn't. Who cares? We are only interested in the interesting people, the ones in the red and gray down at the front here. Those are the ones we see on screen because those are the ones that make a difference in this world. Um, so what does it look like in the Federation beyond just Earth? So we've, we've seen that they've stated more than once that there is no Federation-wide currency. Earth doesn't have money, but the Federation as a whole doesn't have money either. But that doesn't mean that it's true in every Federation territory. So individual territories have a certain degree of economic autonomy. We know that, for example, on Vulcan, they still use money for whatever reason. Um, and, and presumably the same is true on, for each uh, Federation uh, territory. They get to choose whether or not they want to use a money-based economic system, and that's fine, that works. They all have the same abundant, uh, abundance of resources, so it doesn't really matter. However they want to manage the distribution of those resources internally, it's fine, it's all good. Um, there are, however, in the 24th century, scarce resources still. These are things that replicators can't produce for whatever reason. Uh, warp drive, is that warp cores, dilithium crystals, lacnum, a couple of other things, uh, medical uh, um, uh, supplies that can't be replicated. We see that, I mean, every third episode of the Enterprise is <laughs> transporting medical supplies from one planet to another. These are the last remaining scarce resources in the Federation. And they are managed on Marxist principles, which is to say, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. So if you have a, a need for a specific medical supply, and that colony over there has more than enough, what you do is you send the enterprise over, they pick some over there, and they drop it off over here. 
And, and, and on that way, as scarce resources are managed within the Federation, without the need for all, uh, all currency, there's no need for exchange, everything is just done on, a, on the assumption of um, reciprocal altruism. I'll help you out now on the assumption that someday, if I need your help, you'll help me out back. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that it is a perfect economy. It sounds cool, uh, and on a personal level, it sounds pretty, you know, it's, uh, it sounds great because you can either choose to sit on your couch or you can go do something interesting like flying through space. But there is evidence of economic instability in the Federation. So let's look at the uh, 22nd century. This is the Enterprise at XL1, uh, and this is a shot inside of the bridge. Now, this for the 22nd century is a, a beautiful example of engineering. I mean, the, the, the bridge is bristling with technology. Every panel, every open space of wall is occupied by a view screen or a button or a, or a, a cooling vent. So it, it is, it's, it's extremely um, efficient and everything is just, just packed in there for utility. But then we, we jump forward 100 years and we look at the Enterprise 1701 and compare her exterior and her bridge. And look how stark and bland it is. I mean, there's no, there are virtually no external features on the outside, and you have these huge patches of, of unused real estate on the bridge. I mean, bright colors aside, it's kind of boring. It's kind of, it's almost upsetting when, when you see the two together. Jump another hundred years into the future, and now we've got the Enterprise D, which is this enormous, colossal, floating city. And the bridge is like a, it's, it's pure luxury. It's like flying through space in a golden cloud. I mean, even the, the, the helm and operations console has that, Chairs are, are softly padded, so you know, heaven forbid you might suffer a moment of, of discomfort while you're saving the galaxy. Um, but what we're seeing here is a timeline of economic abundance, um, depression, and abundance again. So recovery from economic instability. And this was actually confirmed in an episode of Discovery. I'll try to make this my only spoiler, uh, where Captain Lorca actually mentions that as a result of the Klingon War, the Federation economy, the, the, the novel ideals of abundance for everyone are in trouble because all of the Federation's resources are being funneled into the war effort. They don't have everything available that they need to construct fancy uh, lit up starships. And so we end up with the Constitution class over here, which is kind of a shadow of preceding technology. And if we compare her to the Constitution class from the Kelvin timeline where the Klingon War hasn't happened, I mean, that enterprise is three times the size. Similar design, similar shape, but it's just glowing with technology, and which the, the familiar enterprise that we know just isn't. So even in this supposedly utopian economy, instability <coughs> is possible. Now if we broaden our scope even further beyond the Federation, we know that trade is sometimes necessary with outside powers. Although the Federation is enormous, contains over 150 territories and, and uh, member planets and, and billions, literally billions of individual citizens, Sometimes, uh, even within all of that, certain resources are not available. Um, so they'll need to trade for those resources with outside powers, such as the Klingons, Romulans, Ferengi, whoever has access to the specific resource they need for those scarce resources. And when that's handled, it's barter-based. They still don't need money to do it. In fact, money wouldn't really make sense in a situation like that anyway. When you're dealing with somebody like the Ferengi, the Klingons, or the Romulans, um, they don't, even though all three of those races still use a monetary-based economy, they don't value things the same way that the Federation does. So you would still not have a valid medium of exchange, their money versus our money, uh, in order to, to speak the same monetary language. You'd still have to barter individual resources on an individual basis in order to, to come to a mutually beneficial arrangement. So barter still works, money still not required. But what about personal finance? If you're an individual person living in the United Federation of Planets, what, is, what does your bank account look like? How does that work? Um, well, I already mentioned that reputation is currency. It's a little bit difficult to measure reputation. Um, but here we have Jake Sisko, uh, who's a budding journalist. And we, we see in one scene how he talks to his friend about having sold a story to the United Federation of Planets news service. Now, how, and his friend asks him, how do you sell something if you don't have money? So Jake replies, it's a figure of speech. But what effectively he's done there is he's sold it using the, uh, the currency of reputation. Although Jake Sisko has written this content, he's created it, his distribution network is limited. He doesn't have enough uh, Twitter followers in 24th century terms <laughs> to get his, uh, his message in front of the eyes of the people that he wants to see. But the UFP News Service does. If he's able to present his content to them, and they think it's good enough that they want to distribute it through their distribution network, he gets the feedback uh, currency from them, the reputation from them. 
So he's able to leverage their reputation to boost his own reputation, which then allows him to grow his own uh, private audience. So you see there you have the exchange of reputation from abundance to scarcity. No, no money is required. The same is true of the doctor after he publishes his hollow novel. Of course, there was an episode where there was a lawsuit over who owned the intellectual property today. Why does intellectual property ownership matter? Well, if, currency, if, if uh, reputation is currency, then it matters. If he wants to, uh, to sell future fictional works of his and have people pay attention to them, then the, uh, he needs to own reputation for that work and not the distribution company. Um, but they also have some, um, some examples of individuals who have, for whatever reason, chosen to opt out of this reputation economy and go back to a monetary-based economy. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with that, that's still allowed, because we're still looking at the, the broader context of the legal and economic framework that still facilitates uh, free market capitalism, if you want to. So here are a couple of examples. Devon Arnie Roll, who helped to negotiate the, the rights to that bar and wormhole that we looked, looked at earlier, and uh, Perry Mudd, who you know, is just a shyster, really. Um, <laughs> these two guys are human, mostly. Um, they're from Earth, I think, both of them. Um, but they've chosen to opt out of the reputation economy. In fact, Harry Mudd likes to hide behind pseudonyms, presumably to, to uh, conceal his shady you price. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so they've, they've, you know, they've, they've got tainted reputation for whatever reason, so they choose to use money instead. And that's fine. People kind of look down at them, they think they're a bit silly, but it's fine. They're still able to do that. There's nothing wrong with it, nothing illegal. Um, but what about the issue of Starfleet salaries? Now, we talked about how Starfleet people don't get paid for what they do. But then how does um, Scotty buy a boat? And, uh, uh, and how about spending money on Deep Space Nine? So here we have Quark's bar. Quark being a Ferengi is obsessed with money. Um, but there are lots of Starfleet uniforms among the customers in his bar. How are they able to interact with him economically if they're not using money? Surely they're not bartering for every single drink that they buy from him. Well, with Scotty's boat, it's possible that he's just using a figure of speech again. We know that within a month or two of him having said that line, he was planning to move to, uh, to the Northern Five uh, colony where he was going to live out his retirement. And it could just be that there's a boat waiting for him there 